We begin and we end at night in the woods, but that is not the whole of the story. Some of my earliest memories of falling in love with video games were Anonymous Game Developers Interactive's remakes of the King's Quest franchise. These entirely free, faithful, and extremely ambitious remakes received numerous awards and for good reason. It's pretty ahead of its time in that way, between all the remakes we're getting nowadays, and with the bonus that they were free and were just so fortunate to be easily ran on machines that struggled to run Windows XP, I was absolutely enraptured. Of course, it wasn't just the game itself that created such fond memories. I recall my sister Dad and I printing out a paper walkthrough and inching our way through the remake trilogy of King's Quest. It took months, and I absolutely adored it. So we continued and found more point-and-click adventure games to play together. On our own, my sister and I were enraptured by the likes of Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish, but with my dad there, we could get away with more mature-seeming point-and-click adventure games, having him there to protect us when things got too intense. We'd get through games such as Grim Fandango as my young brain soaked in these gorgeous art styles that felt so unique to the point-and-click genre. Once I ran out of point-and-click adventure games I was interested in, however, gradually drifting towards my interest in Nintendo properties around 10 or 11, I took a brief break from spending as much time with my father and sister, during which puberty had sent me all kinds of confusing and conflicting signals. It took a while before I would revisit the point-and-click franchises I became infatuated with. As I did, it seemed that there had been a new rush of games similar to what I grew up with. But that simplified the puzzle-solving and aimless exploration with a focus on RPGs dialogue that was supposedly supposed to affect the main plot. That particular combination was fascinating to me, and from 2012, with the release of The Walking Dead, I became a huge fan of the genre. The genre wasn't without controversy, however. Even upon the release of The Walking Dead, a backlash had been developing. It only worsened, as with the release of Telltale's subsequent games, which reused similar gameplay mechanics, The Walking Dead Season 2, The Wolf Among Us, Game of Thrones, and so on, the formula began to be considered extremely formulaic. While this criticism was absolutely valid, it gradually became encased in a drama stirring around the same time. A situation with confused morals, a situation that largely ended up as a harassment campaign whose language is still regularly used in criticism. And it begins with a little game called Gone Home. Released in 2013, Gone Home is a short game about exploring an abandoned childhood house for clues about where your family went. It begins with somewhat sinister undertones as the player is uncertain what big event has caused the occupants of the house to leave in such a hurry. The protagonist, though, as they explore, begins to receive clarity. If you're like me and are a scared little baby, the protagonist is also likely to light up the house as they go along. The house that at one point had been so intimidating to explore has become calm. The threat is no longer potentially supernatural, but the result of family tension that gradually erodes. The exploration and narrative serve a combined purpose in this way. And It and Tacoma, also by Fulbright, are some of the most well-written games I've ever experienced. However, during that time, a largely right-wing push began developing that comprised a large contingency of the gaming community. It was something that I was unfortunately a part of when I was young and still influenced by my parents' uh, conservative beliefs. Though even at the time, I found myself somewhat confused as to why these criticisms occurred. As a young queer person myself, games like Gone Home spoke to me, and I struggled to understand what it was about these games that found themselves at the center of controversy. Quickly, games without combat or complex systems became a subject for derision. Games like Firewatch or What Remains of Edith Finch, as 
well as similarly artsy independent experiences were derided as not being games in and of themselves. At the same time as these games were given hate for their lack of mechanics, attempts were made to legitimize gaming as a medium, creating a deeply hypocritical contradiction wherein one must fit to a certain mold in order to be considered a game. Meanwhile, art is an expression of various disparate ideas that take different individualized forms. How could games be considered art when unique games had their legitimacy constantly under questioning, often with those critics never having played them? Although there is some legitimacy to the criticism, as oftentimes a clever mechanical system can be a draw, the idea that those systems create value is antithetical to games as a medium and storytelling more generally. Gone Home does have mechanics, even though comparatively they are more simplistic than games with extensive combat or puzzle solving. These mechanics as well reflect the thematic nature of the game. It's simple, and it is beautiful in that simplicity. As a point of contrast, Starfield's recent release has been a notable failure in comparison to previously released Fallout 4 and Skyrim. The game is abundant with methods by which the protagonist can interact and exist within the world. However, while the combat, story, and character progression were noted as improvements from their previous entries, Starfield's exploration was a point of criticism. Rather than the lavishly and hand-decorated worlds of Bethesda's past, procedural generation was used to expand the size of the map. Exploration being so important to Bethesda games, the lack of a positive fan response is understandable, as one key aspect of what made those games work was suddenly neutered, even if the rest of it included an array of improvements. An abundance of individually developed mechanics in this incident creates distance between the artistic purpose of the game and what the character's role in that universe is. There are games that manage to scale well, but oftentimes, by trying to do everything, you rarely please anyone. Games as a medium is capable of telling all kinds of stories, especially in the independent scene with a fairly small barrier of entry when compared to film, a variety of voices is a huge asset. The unconventional ways in which some independent games leak their gameplay and storytelling is fascinating to explore. The aforementioned mission Firewatch, for example, a game that received backlash for being a walking simulator, used the mechanic of exploration and dialogue trees to create a captivating mystery thriller. Some of my favorite moments were early in the game when I didn't know what direction the game would go with its horror elements, and just like the protagonists were busy theorycrafting in a large, lonely, empty forest. It was a moment of emotional resonance that managed to quickly engross me in its world. Even though the mechanics were fairly straightforward, the process of playing let me inhabit the perspective with being deliberate in what mechanics to include. In some way, I think that having an interest in independent adventure games allowed me to grow significantly as a person by seeing the world from perspectives outside my own. One of them, though, holds a unique significance. Night in the Woods was released in 2017 by now defunct developer Infinite Fall, and I think it's in a perfect adventure game. I think its gameplay connects the player to the protagonist in a way that communicates messages about living in the almost post-apocalyptic wasteland of late capitalism destruction of small southern towns. It does this while also being some of the most accurate dialogue of young adults I've experienced. It understands and expresses its characters through so many subtleties in their speech that attempting to understand them as characters is almost as difficult as understanding real people. It has a plot that follows a literary pace, with influences from Southern Gothic authors like Flannery O'Connor. Find the Woods is a piece of art, but it's also extremely hard to write about, for one reason which you likely already know and have opinions about. I'll address this early. Alakalika took his own life on August 31st, 2019, following the physical and emotional abuse of Zoe Quinn. Neither the abuse nor his death needed to happen. It was a horrible tragedy all around, and my personal experiences of Night in the Woods pale in comparison to the gravity of importance this story demands. I wish for the best for Zoe, all those unnamed he heart, and Holowaka's family. Scott Benson, the co-developer of the game, wrote a brief article that summarizes the situation best. I recommend you read it. I will be highlighting a brief section, though. It gives some pretty important context. 
I want to give the guy credit for the ways he did change, at least, as far as I could see. I want to say he was a brilliant developer and musician. After his 2015 absence, he never quite considered Night in the Woods to be his game. When we were driving through the back roads of Camber County that day in 2016, he said he someday wanted to make something that was his. Something that came completely from him. After Night in the Woods came out, aside from finishing up the content patch and bug fixes, he quickly moved on. He wasn't involved in much of what was going on with it. He dropped out of talks that were supposed to do together. He wasn't really interested in other things you were thinking of doing with it. He was excited to release the soundtrack, and recently we were working on a small epilogue game. But otherwise, he was gone. While I praise Alex's work, consider this. People left the industry because of what he did. People gave up their dreams, the art they wanted to make. People, drawn by the promise of working with a well-known indie developer, found themselves caught between giving up their dreams and financial stability and getting away from him. People spent years with him as a destructive presence in their lives. People developed PTSD. People spent hours and money on therapy. People felt trapped by him. It's hard for me to see how one man's work is worth what he did to so many others. I've gone back and forth on how to address this. After beating Nine in the Woods for the first time, I kept the soundtrack he composed on repeat. It was an important companion through lots of projects. Now when I listen to it, it just hurts to remember everything that happened. I thought about not including the soundtrack, but the game feels incomplete without it, and I'm not sure if simply not including his work is a mature way to address this. Instead, I think a good compromise is to begin with the preface, and to present Night in the Woods as it exists in full, knowing that Alex's work wasn't just restricted to the soundtrack. I want to make it clear that this happened, and real people were hurt. Throughout this essay, remember that. Keep it in the back of your head. It really hasn't left mine. Night in the Woods begins with a poem. It's from May about her grandfather. He talks about the death of the town, the disasters that took away the city he knew. He looks out the window before he dies and says, this house is haunted. Interpreting this poem, in my view, the house is referring to the city the game takes place in, Possum Springs. While not literally haunted, Possum Springs is metaphorically haunted by all those who lived and died within it. It's haunted by exploitation of disaster and of tragedy. These people, their voices lost to the gradual erosion of time, pushed by the forces of capitalism seeking to wipe Possum Springs off the map, still echo. A mural behind May of the former Possum Springs hangs over the station as a reminder of what the town once was. It's a connection to small southern towns, grounding the setting. May herself, in being gone for a few years in college, is also remembering a different version of Possum Springs. After handing the not-at-all-suspicious janitor a soda from the dreamy fiasco boss vending machine, May leaves the train station. Unfortunately, though, her parents misremembered the day she was set to arrive, and she has to walk her way home. After a dubious journey through the woods and being picked up, May returns home. Other than giving the context that May is returning home from college for some nebulous reason, and that her parents didn't come to pick her up, this introduction establishes May's attitude and character. May will comment on anything the player walks past, and many of these things, like the train in the playground, call back to May's past. The portrait of May's family, as she'll comment on later, is a moment frozen in time that watches over the family in perpetuity. May's mother, too, will come to mention the addition of a convenience store and the death of an old woman May knew. The nature of time and its passing is extremely common to the magical realist genre, and begins to show connections here. A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozakai, one of my favorite novels, touches on this theme similarly, writing, The past is weird. I mean, does it really exist? It feels like it exists, but where is it? And if it did exist, but doesn't now, then where did it go? 
This section also shows the cinematographic techniques the game will come to use. May at the beginning of the story and throughout the game will walk le right to left, typically a cinematographic technique that references the characters moving away from their objective. Most platformers, to use a reference relevant to video games, will signify progress by moving left to right. With the constant right to left progress, even the train in the background following this pattern during the introduction, the idea is established that May is going back in time and away from progress. The following day, after having a riveting eel-based conversation, May sets out. We'll, me we'll meet a bunch of key players walking down this street. Selmers, Mr. Chaskov, Lori, and all the other characters who find themselves down this street will comprise the various brief stories who will come to reflect the themes of late capitalism, fate, and decay. We learn that May's history with the town isn't entirely spotless as well, Lori mentioning how she beat somebody with a baseball bat in the past. May can also bounce a ball of yarn around, which is actually the one instance in the entirety of the game where the species of a character is referenced. Beneath the city is a mural. These murals will be a consistent theme throughout the game, and were also based off of the real-life WPA murals. FDR's New Deal work programs will put more than 8 million back to work. And not everybody is laying roads and mixing cement. The program also employs over 40,000 in various art projects. This unprecedented harnessing of artistic talents will create thousands of paintings, sculptures, and murals for public buildings across the county. But today, nearly a third of this artwork is missing. The historical grounding of these murals are important to the plot. As we'll see later, these connections will become more explicit. It's hard not to see May as deeply naive and irresponsible during the early parts of this game. She changes as the story continues, discovering her responsibilities and the need to put effort into herself, but as for now, May is representative of the kind of apathy that causes stagnation through an inability to reflect on one's actions and live with the consequences. But May herself can only be partly blamed for her circumstances. Between the trauma of losing her grandfather and a history of violent outbursts, May has been unable to give herself the time and space necessary to mature. As Robert Sapolsky writes in his book Behave the Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst, if you're stressed like a normal mammal in an acute physical crisis, the stress response is life-saving. But if you instead chronically activate the stress response for psychological stress, your health suffers. May has been in a state of constant stress. The stress is often used to convince younger individuals of their laziness, and that experiencing stress should be a motivating factor. Often, people glamorize working to the point of collapse, but it leaves you exhausted and oftentimes stunted. There is an important distinction between responsibility and blame, and while May is responsible for her actions, it isn't necessary to assign her blame for not doing more. It often takes time for someone to bloom. The rate at which we expect people to mature is often in Congress to the amount of time and effort necessary to grow. Possum Springs only having the one doctor who handles both physical and mental elements further highlights this. His patients, May and Selma, are given the same form of coping in form of the journal, but they have entirely different situations. This is representative of the lack of proper mental health support those in towns like Possum Springs receive. On top of this, they experience the strain of living under capitalism itself. As Mark Fisher writes in Capitalist Realism, it goes without saying that all mental illnesses are neurologically instigated, but this says nothing about their causation. By focusing on individualism in response to mental illness rather than identifying the societal causes, it allows for capitalism to continue unquestioned. May eventually finds her way to her old friend Greg and meets up with him in the supporting cast, which includes him, his boyfriend Angus, and their mutual friend B. They go to brand practice, have pizza, and find a severed arm with a strange diamond tattoo on the street. We'll come back to this mystery later, but for now, not much comes of it. The story is still predominantly focused on May exploring her hometown. The first half of the game's conflict comes from not understanding fully who May is and what her purpose in the world is, a reflection of where May is at this point in her life. In Coming Home, May is able to compare what she grew up with and how it is today. Now it ends up as a hollow, barren reflection of what it once was. It's no wonder then that most of this game is considered aimless, as was common criticism on release. Madison Butler in Two Years Later, Night in the Woods is Still Relatable writes, 
to wait for the game to start implies that you are playing a game that is somehow winnable. But Night in the Woods is not a game that you can win. It's just a slice of May's life in which players exist for a moment in time. Besides, no one is going to win life forever in their 20s. That night, May and her friends attend a party. It's here that we conclude our first act and discover the larger conflicts of the story. The world of these characters and their place in them has largely been established at this point. Once May makes a bit of an ass of herself, May gives her a reality check. She says that she would kill for the opportunities May has, and that May's maturity makes it frustrating that she was given so many repeated chances. Meanwhile, Bee's had to work non-stop and she's not had the time to decide on any aspect of her life saying, I stayed here and got older while you went off and stayed the same. B takes May to her bed. She apologizes for blowing up. May has her first of many gene sequences here. It foreshadows what May's time in college is like, given the statue's resemblance to the one she recalls later. She breaks down the symbol that represented her time in college, and after this, she wakes up. At the start of the second act, we are introduced to another large theme in the game, constellations. Constellations are largely based on the story of real life ones. The stars remain as a vestige of a society long dead, with permanent reminders in the sky assigned meaning by its observers. Even then, their stories continue to find reference in modern day. As stated by Jason Hickel in Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World, Capitalism did not put an end to serfdom, rather it put an end to the progressive revolution that ended serfdom. It's an important thing to realize, to find peace within, that these moods, these feelings have been felt before and continue to matter. In a way, they seem to echo the themes of the murals present throughout the game. While the murals are a symbol with a dying meaning, the stars are a symbol whose meaning is found in stories. With the bath of the church now open, we are introduced to Kate and Bruce's story. Kate is a lovely woman, and I would die for her. She's never pushy with her religion and spends a game trying to give Bruce shelter. It's so refreshing to see re religious people depicted in this way, where their faith is only one aspect of what they and their church accomplish. The Woods has a reverence alongside its criticisms of small towns, and in its moments like this, it becomes most clear. The game attempts to depict these cities as they are, as complex as everywhere else. A further example, traveling underground reveals that someone graffitied Nuke Possum Springs on the previously present mural. Many don't know, let alone care, about its history, and this act of vandalism shows how little the knowledge of the town's history is known or matters among its residents. And it's no fault of their own, as it's rare for the stories of the poor to be expressed. The cry of the poor is not always just, but if you don't listen to it, you'll never know what justice is. Howard Zinn, A People's History of the United States. If you don't know, Night in the Woods gives you multiple branching paths on who to hang out with, mostly between Greg and B. While Greg's stories are lovely and Greg is the best boy ever, I think that B's storyline is more closely related to the themes of the game, and so for the purpose of this playthrough, I'll be focusing on B's plot. B is a character trapped by the circumstances of her family business. She notes that she has questioned her belief in God because there used to be a degree of magic to the unknown, but now the unknown means that she's not in control. B is therefore representative of the situation many end up in, unable to enact action towards their own goals and in such helplessness straining their faith. As Noam Chomsky writes in On Anarchism, the public must be reduced to passivity in the political realm, but for submissiveness to become a reliable trait, it must be entrenched in the realm of belief. The helplessness of the larger economic circumstances results in the loss of hope and faith in those who must survive under capitalist system. B stands as an example of this, someone whose sense of identity and purpose is strained for the sake of keeping her family business afloat. 
Pushed to the brink of stress, oftentimes those residing within exploitive situations will be trapped by the difficulty of doing something that would relieve the stress of those circumstances. Further, taking the kind of action May recommends later would unfortunately not leave B in a better state. Due to the lack of parental support B has in comparison to May, it's difficult for May to conceptualize how abuse is often reinforced by the society one lives in. The mall depicted later is itself a symbol of capitalist decline, as well a clear representation of economic hardship washing away memories and small businesses. In that section, it's also telling that B is so reluctant to steal while May is rather flippant about it. While B is subject to expectations and would have to face the repercussions by straining her and her father's life if caught, May's repercussions would be comparatively minor. May's view of the world is fairly simplistic here, as she seems to struggle with conceptualizing the situations of other people. Meanwhile, B struggles with almost constant complexity that drains her of any sort of energy to fight back. The two complement as much as they contrast one another. May is able to bring out some of the magic B lost in her childhood, while B is able to help May develop as a person and empathize with others' situations. After the mall section, May comes home and watches some TV with her dad. That night, she dreams of a large bear and an orchestra in what looks like a flooded city. There's a lot of theories on what these sections represent. Although I'm not the authority, I do have a theory. Given the theme of representations of the past and how they're distorted or retained over time, I would guess that these sections are May exploring a kind of echo, not necessarily spirits or ghosts in a literal sense, but acting as an incorporeal past that may have never existed in the first place. Those beasts, the one which May will in the future interpret as God, are pieces of the world being lost to decay. Possum Springs is haunted by the past and its citizens, aimlessly meandering the few remaining ruins of a town sunk by greed. It is a reminder of the inevitability of the end to come, of time's inevitable passing, and the hopes and dreams of the past becoming meaningless objects. And even then, it's the world that ends before things are able to change. It's easier to imagine the end to the world than an end to capitalism. The following day, May and B have the chance to fix a radiator for an old lady. Once more, May is able to bring some kind of the childlike wonder to B, as while they sit on Miss Miranda's front porch, May brings around a bunch of fireflies to help B feel better. It's really sweet, and it's clear that May and B are starting to patch things up. And after another night of watching TV with her dad, May has another dream like she had the night before. There's an odd attitude which the citizens of Possum Springs have about May. They'll continually mention her unemployment, and when they find this information out, they'll consider her lesser. The nature of jobs in the game is a really interesting one. One side of the story sees someone attempting to interview and find a new job while still needing to work their current one. Yet outside of construction workers and seeing May's dad at work, there's not a lot of meaning found in it. People talk about it like a burden, like something forced upon them, which it often is. As David Graeber writes in Bullshit Jobs, we have become a civilization based on work. Not even productive work, but work as an end and meaning in itself. It doesn't seem to matter what job, but just working in and of itself that provides value for many of the residents of Pots and Springs. Homeless people like Bruce and jobless adults like May are considered lesser, and without spoiling what happens later, disposable. It seems the city council is pushing back on the idea of housing Bruce, even though they have the space and could do good with it, solely due to being considered undesirable. This section also offers the opportunity for May to hang out with Lori. Laying on the train tracks, the two discuss their lives, their idiosyncrasies, and similarities. May and Lori relate on how they both have intrusive thoughts and perspectives on the world, though Lori seems to have comparatively absent parents in comparison to May. She'll continue to be present throughout the game, and her and May's discussions are always uniquely cozy. We also have the first germ hangout in the section. The two of them stand in the parking lot during the hangout, observing the emptiness of it, wondering how they ever even needed as much parking. 
the parking lot, like much of Boston Springs, is just a shadow of a shadow, a facsimile of the past reality. After this, we enter the third hangout with B. The two plan to have dinner together, and it seems to be going well until the pair return home. Here, we'll get some insight on B's living situation. Her father is controlling, forcing B to take over the family business while taking the credit. However, May doesn't really have the best tact, and through trying to help, angers B. May suggests an impossible solution and quitting, something that would only make B's situation worse. B talks about an employee who had a history of creeping on young women, but who still works at the store, who has a family to provide for. Contexts that don't make the situation better, but understandable as to why action isn't taken. As B says, a lot of the time, folks can't just choose to do whatever it is you decree to be the right thing. A lot of the times, people do the things they do because they can't do anything else. May's understanding of the world at this point in time seems to not take into consideration how difficult just getting through the day can be for some people. B confronting May like this should hopefully let May see what she doesn't understand about B and those like her. May leaves soon after the fight and heads home on her own. After another dream, May wakes up and, in talking with her mother, has another fight. Here, it's revealed that May's family is struggling to keep their house, both of her parents working as hard as they can to retain it. She mentions how hard it was to get May into college in the first place, how much time and effort was necessary to put in before she decides it's not her. May's mom mentions how hard it was to get May into college in the first place, how much time and effort was necessary to put in before she decided it wasn't for her. May implies that she's the most recent failure in a long lineage of failures, and her mother doesn't respond. It's a moment where the effects of May's aimlessness and lack of responsibility are seen most clearly. Between her mom and B, May's responses indicate she's fully aware of how she's inadequate, but that she doesn't see how her actions affect other people. She's certainly not selfish as much as childish. The following day is the Harvest Festival. It's pretty cute! You get to play some carnival games, chat with friends, and participate in a play. It gives some cool lore to the town of Possum Springs, and the curse mentioned in the play is prescient to the story as well. In the play, those who live in the town are doomed to die within it. The not at all suspicious janitor shows up here and gives some cryptic lines as well. He does mention something interesting though. We begin and we end at night in the woods, but that's not the whole of the story. Outside, after the play is over and the festival is wrapped up, a ghostly figure chokes out and carries away someone in the background, and May is the only one who saw it. The kidnapping serves as the midpoint of the story. The threat has become externalized and May enters the long fall before the climax. The following day, May's mother and her discuss the state of the house more thoroughly and apologize to one another. Though May is clearly shaken, she doesn't share what happened the previous night, instead electing to ask for help among her friends. May continues through her normal day otherwise, looking at constellations, listening to Selmer's poetry, and talking. In the canal system, we meet an old woman who knew May's grandfather. She provides an interesting background in that her grandfather was a troublemaker, and that Possum Springs is a former company town. Based on the realities of US history, between the WPA murals and former status as a company town, Possum Springs continues to be a clear representation of the generational effects of capitalist exploitation. Capital goes wherever there are men, poor enough to be exploited. Peter Kropotkin, The Conquest Abroad. After May attends band practice, she discusses her plan of action for trying to find out what happened. The player has the ability to choose different directions, but for this playthrough, we'll start with the library. 
As soon as May and B enter the library, B comments on the mural in a really poignant way. She says, weird, like when this was painted, it was like, hey, look through the window, we're all working, things are great. Now it's like one of the graffiti murals after someone gets shot or hit by a car. In other words, the symbolic representation of hope has turned into something to mourn. Rather than looking back fondly, it's looking back on a history people believe is better, a future that never came, like a mural for the life of someone lost before their time. The symbol of a bright potential future has become a piece of the past, a somber reminder. The city didn't die of natural causes. It was murdered by a system none of them are, despite continuous efforts, despite strikes and wars, able to change. As May and B's search for evidence of ghosts, they read several news articles that have little relation to poltergeists, but provide some background on specific former events in Possum Springs. I won't go too far into it, but the articles definitely repeat a lot of the themes we've seen associated with Possum Springs so far. They extrapolate on three potential locations to search, and from there have an angle for their investigation. As they leave, though, they notice a few people holding a poetry reading. Selmer's here has one of the best poems I've read. Not even in games, just in general. It's called There Is No Reception in Possum Springs. I'll be reading it in full. No reception here. I wave my black phone in the air like a flare. Like a prayer. But no reception. I read on the internet, babyface boy billionaire. Phone apps sold me more money in one day than my family over a hundred generations. More than my whole world ever has. World where house buying jobs became rent paying jobs became living with family jobs. Boy billionaires. Money is access, access to politicians waiting for us to die, lead in our water, alcohol and painkillers, replace my job with an app, replace my dreams of a house in a yard with a couch in a basement. The future is yours. Forced 24 7 entrepreneurs, I just want a paycheck in my own life. I'm on the couch in the basement. They're in the house in the yard. Some night I will catch a bus out to the west coast and burn their Silicon City to the ground. Encapsulating the themes of exploitation and the decline of small towns due to capitalist expansion, Selmer's poems expresses a universal feeling of hopelessness in the face of such huge external forces. Dreams were formed and then beaten down by the same forces. Hope and faith in the future gradually eroded by the reality that the future was not intended for you. And it is easy to understand why someone may give up, why inaction may be preferable, as these aren't forces that attempt to convince you a positive future is possible. In Noam Chomsky's Understanding Power, he writes, If you want to feel hopeless, there are a lot of things you could feel hopeless about. But if you act on that assumption, then you're guaranteeing that that'll happen. If you act on the assumption that things can change, maybe they will. Samuel's poetry acts as an expression of this, where fighting may not be easy and it may not even be worth it in the end, but in the face of these impossible circumstances, the last thing someone wants to do is ignore what is causing harm. Selmers manages to use what she knows to make sense of her place in the world. The following day, May is able to hang out with her mother for the only time throughout the game. She takes her out to an open field and talks about her history with May. And the two connect. They talk about life, and a feeling emerges that she and May aren't too different. Recognizing her mom with a shared, unvoiced kinship, it's an important moment for May. She's at this moment rebuilding the strained connections that her rival highlighted, and as she confronts that strain, is able to change. This section also introduces Mr. Salvi. He's collecting junk and exploring the canals. 
This was introduced in the Weird Autumn update and gives some Kentucky Route Zero-esque exploration-based background to Possum Springs. As they explore, they end up on another WPA mural. This one, buried deep in the canals, isn't seen as often as the one in the more populated areas. May states, places can't control how they're remembered. They just hang out and then fall apart. It's a harrowing statement about the idea of entropy, how everything must one day pass, and how hard it is for any meaning to remain. What will art mean for people hundreds of years down the road? How is it for the artist to retain any sort of control over that meaning, let alone if it manages to get that far? Pieces of art like the Lost Mural are likely not to make it there, and there are hundreds like them, pieces washed away that once meant so much for a community, let alone the thousands of millions who've died before their time, or who've had their dreams and aspirations eroded and broken. We'll also be able to hang out with Germ here again, and he'll take May to a place also affected by the flood, a small cave underneath the bridge. It provides a nice little bit of levity after the darkness of the previous chapter. Here we'll meet Rabies, the perfect animal, and discuss how there's many caves like the one they explore around town, how Germ is the only one to have charted them. These moments offer contrast to the moment reflecting on entropy, taking a more positive spin that even when everything changes through disaster or just the passing of time, there are parts of the world to explore and find beauty within. May and B then go to the graveyard in search of what May believes to be a ghost. B takes a moment to be with her mom, who has passed, and May takes a look through the various graves. They're largely unsuccessful, ending on the pair falling into a sinkhole, surfacing a coffin, which potentially has clues. They just kind of see a skeleton, though. The pair are then chased off by what seems to be the presence that kidnapped the kid from Harvest. Since they didn't get a good look at them, though, it's possible for it to be unrelated. I find it a bit strange that May isn't really believed with the police and her family and all that when it comes to the ghost, quote unquote. Like, of course it is a bit out there, but I feel like they should be taking the investigation a bit more seriously. I don't know. Anyways, that night, May dreams that she speaks to a strange entity. It speaks about how there is no god how it is an entity that has existed throughout time, observing a kind of eldritch truth. It implies May is seeing an impossible truth about a nature of the universe. It says there is a hole in the center of the universe and it's getting forgotten, leaving nothing to remember it, just the hole uh, lacking. And it implies nothing matters, that the universe is in a constant state of unraveling. It's the last dream May will have, and I think that, as observed earlier, the creature is part of a kind of spirit world that comprises the echoes of the past. Not literal, but metaphorical ghosts of Possum Springs. I think it may be part of the town itself, or the land it's on, or it could be a god. However, I don't necessarily believe everything it says to be entirely truthful. It could very well be a manifestation of May's anxiety, but most importantly, I think it does understand a core fundamental truth, that everything must come to an end. And May, seeing those in her life struggling to leave Possum Springs, or even hold on to the parts of the town they love, is being told these messages over and over again, and it's no wonder that she's struggling to take on responsibility. Why would she when everything ends anyways, when nothing seems to truly matter? Although I didn't play through the section on this playthrough, I think that Angus' response provides a decent response to this idea. I believe in a universe that doesn't care, but people who do. May addresses the thing she saw in her dreams directly with Kate in the church. She starts off by speaking with the town council, who seem to be against the idea of sheltering Bruce. It seems doomed to failure. 
May then changes the subject to her dream, and Kate pushes back on the idea of the creature she spoke to being God. May then criticizes her, saying that because she doesn't believe in God 100%, she's failing her role as a pastor. It's one of those moments that create a conflict in relating with May on this playthrough. I think Kate's honesty about God and her asking about May's loneliness was the most tactful and sweet way to address her concerns about entropy and belief. May is under quite a bit of stress, however, and her frustration about Kate's uncertainty in God is understandable when May's own faith is being strained in the face of what she saw the night before. The hard part about death about how everything will one day vanish is that no one seems to have the answers on how to cope with it. It's something you have to find for yourself. Bruce says he's leaving, going home to his kids. It's unclear whether this is true or not, but it's more than likely that he's just moving on, that he thinks the work Kate did was kind, but that he isn't worthy of that kindness. He vows to quit drinking, to not do violence, and to be better. After this, he'll be gone. Bruce's story makes my heart hurt. <laughs> Kate does so much for him, and all this effort that gets undone by the council members, and he knows this, and he tries to do better out of that kindness, but he can't let her put her job in jeopardy for him. It really goes to show how heartless this council is in regards to those struggling with homelessness. Lori and Germ are available for brief hangouts here, neither of which provide a huge amount to talk about, but it's nice to chat with them. I think one of the most important aspects of Night in the Woods is how much the characters feel like real people, and even when not much is said, it's always nice to be around people you know. These connections all these years later still matter to me, even though none of it is real. I still take messages from this game I didn't know I could. Art is lovely in that way, and it grows with you. That night, May and B attend a party. May meets a girl here who she definitely doesn't have a gay panic over. Once May comes back over to B, however, she seems to be acting strange. She's receptive to everything a couple of college kids say, laughing awkwardly and seeming, for the first time, out of her element. May gets in the way of B attempting to seemingly take on the role of college student just to hang out with them. B likely just wants an escape, a moment where she can picture herself as a college kid. B likely just wants an escape, a moment where she can picture herself as a college kid and not running her dad's store. It's a really hard place to be, to want a life you know that you can't have, that is passing you by every moment, but that you can't seem to escape from. It's suffocating and isolating. It's a feeling I relate really well to. I'm often very ashamed of my life circumstances, and I've even driven two hours to go to various parties just to pretend I'm someone I'm not, just like B. She says, I have to dream about this. This thing you're so over already is like my wildest fantasy. May at this point seems to understand this when the barriers of miscommunication are starting to break down. They know they're stuck, both trapped by circumstances outside their control, but being stuck together isn't really that bad. The next morning, May and her mom talk about their financial situation, and the two tell each other how much they love one another. She takes a walk out to the bridge, and talks to Rabies about a positive vision of the future she had when she was a kid, living on a farm and working hard, coming home to a woman. It's a soft, kind future, dreamlike and far off. It's also a hard reality to reach, feeling so distant from the conditions of modernity. As reality sets in, those dreams become memories, and often painful ones, in how you know it wasn't possible after all. May then tells Kate about Bruce, and though she says it's okay, it's clear that she's devastated. As May continues through town, and no matter who she talks to, it's clear something is wrong. She's off, dissociating, sick and floaty, but she insists that she's okay. 
Her mother lets her rest on the couch in the church. She lies there, the ghost of her grandfather beside her, a moment of calm amidst all the insanity around her. The next hangout involving Greg in this playthrough mentions a preventable explosion that the workers protested, only for the government to send in soldiers who opened fire. There's a countless number of similar examples. If we consider America a democracy, it can seem contradictory as to why American history is filled with stories that push against unionization. Democracy is viewed as a luxury, only possible under conditions of relative affluence coupled with a strong middle-class presence to guarantee political stability. Unionization stands in conflict with these efforts. It's no wonder that these efforts are stamped out and rarely taught in schools. It would fundamentally shake the idea that citizens have a say in how their government treats them. Living in the shadow, it's easy to be demoralized, but I think that it's also important to realize that it's not hopeless. And here we approach the end. May feels compelled to go to the woods where she saw the figure escape. She travels there with her friends, hoping to find what's been stalking her all this time. She stops at a minecart and becomes fixated on how it's been there all this time, repeating old, so old, so old. They continue up the hill, over a cliff, and they see something unexpected. A cult ritually mutilating one of its members. The four are caught watching, and they all escape. All except May. May walks home from the forest, clutching her stomach. She eventually passes out and is carried to the church. Her family and friends are there. Lori seems distressed that she cares about May, that she is a good person, and had written a part for her in a movie. Mr. Chazakov recalls the time they spent watching the stars. Selmers expresses frustration that this happened to May, of all people. It's revealed that May fell during the chase, and did an unknown amount of damage. The connections May's form throughout the game feels the most impactful here, as while she was mature, she was genuinely a good person. The scene transfers to a hospital, and we observe the last person to say something for May, the janitor, who says she's going to be just fine. When May wakes up, her first words are, the house is gone. It's dead. She's talking about her and her family's house. It's still there, but it's just being unfairly profit off of more than anything else. And the memories of the town have been tainted by how it stands now, a hollow, exploited shell. May continues to Greg's house. After they all catch up and May lays down, she provides B with important information on her backstory. She starts by explaining about when she beat a child with a baseball bat when she was younger. She was playing a game when suddenly it lost its meaning. It stopped being something real and became something that had been made that would never exist. She feels like she lost those fictional people, and it went further, stripping away that connection from other people, from herself. She's likely describing derealization here. She lost her sense of reality and importance. And she needed help. Needed professional help for years. But she's not had the words, nor ability, to seek that help. May continues talking and begins to discuss why she left college. Feeling scared about leaving the dorms, drinking cough syrup to fall asleep, and being scared all the time, it's likely that May doesn't really even understand what happened and is trying to piece it together for herself. These are likely symptomatic of a dissociative and anxiety disorder, but I won't play psychiatrist. What's more important is that this is why May came home, why she's done the things she did. 
I think she's finally opening up in a genuine way here as a way to take on responsibility for the bad things happening around her. At the same time, though, she's taking on too much of that responsibility, thinking that she's to blame for everything that happened during the past couple weeks. So she does something short-sighted and leaves on her own, trying to solve it herself. Fortunately, her friends arrive as soon as she interacts with the figure that's been haunting her. They won't let her do it alone, and they, despite all of May's doubts, believe her. They follow the figure into a mine. Stepping down into the cave, they travel down further to an elevator bathed in red light. Further and further we're down, they walk with the black outline of the cave, blinking small white lights like stars. And at the end, it's here. They find the cold next to a hole in the cave. They explain their reasoning, saying that some nebulous he doesn't want me to leave. Who is he? It was something found deep underground, a dried up well that was dug deeper and deeper within. A miner falls into the same hole, no sound for when he lands, and when the other miner with him calls down, he doesn't hear a response from anything human. It's like a voice inside his head. They call it the Black Goat, and the cult believes that the Black Goat calls for sacrifices. Once they started throwing people in the hole, allegedly disaster stopped. Things went better for the townspeople. So the cult continued taking people, throwing them down the hole for the prosperity of the town. They rationalize it through classism, that those they killed weren't going to be productive members of society anyways. It's here we also learn about Casey. He was deemed undesirable, just like the hundreds before him, and killed senselessly for a force that clearly couldn't care less. The cultists are representative of the kind of major reaction that is easy for those in power to take advantage of. As Naomi Klein writes in The Shock Doctrine, in moments of crisis, people are willing to hand over a great deal of power to anyone who claims to have a magic cure. In a moment where the town was under the threat of dying, they needed any sort of reason to believe it could get better. So they decide that the town's prosperity is more important than the marginalized. It's a dark reflection of the ways in which billions of people live in poverty for the sake of a few people's dreams. The cultists want to put it back together on the bodies of those on the fringes of society. The black goat to the cultists likely represents the institutional structure of capitalism, creating stratification and killing those who aren't privileged enough to have the benefits the cult members have, allowing them to keep the dream of Possum Springs alive. But for what? The town has been under constant economic and even geographical strain even after they started sacrificing people to the Black Goat. These structures, this town, it's unfair and it's cruel. Institutional structures are legitimate insofar as they enhance the ability to freely inquire and create out of inner need. Otherwise, they are not. Noam Chomsky, Chomsky on Anarchism. But what is the Black Goat, really? Deeper in the cave, May speaks to it directly. She says that ever since the incident with the game, she's been losing touch with reality. She's been pulled further and further down a sinking feeling in her chest. She knows that she will keep losing things, that she's going to be hurt. But it's time to stop running. She faces those fears and says that even if she can't control what happens, she can hope and hurt in love. Because caring means it meant something. The black goat for May is the hole at the center of her life that sucked everything away from her. Because of that loss, she disconnects, tries to reduce how much it hurts. But here she understands the feelings and accepts that she can't change it, just how she responds to it. When we are no longer able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Victor E. Frankel, Man Search for Meaning. May and her friends climb from the well in Germ's backyard. They return home, and May reflects on everything that happened in an extended message. She understands now that it's people that matter, whether it be the blackout or capitalism or depression. It's not something we deserve, but we're here nevertheless, and we're here together. To care is to fight back. To try and fail is to do all you can. To love is to make meaning. The world will end one day, 
You will die, and all your memories, all your loved ones will die too. But the beginning and the end isn't life. It's everything in between. It's the struggle, and the pain, and the beauty. Night in the Woods ends on an epilogue. She talks to her dad about how he struggles with his job. He notes that at one point he was able to provide for May and he notes that at one point he was able to provide for May's mom so she'd be able to pursue her hobbies, but now he just works because he has to. If you picked up the tooth from the crossface as well, he thanks her. It's a piece of his dad's past. May promises to pick it if the workers at Ham Panther ever go on strike. She says goodbye. She says goodbye to Rabies, telling him how much she appreciates him just existing. She speaks to Selmers, has a nice little conversation. May can look at the last few constellations with Mr. Chaskov. In the end, May goes to band practice. Greg and Angus mention how they're likely going to move. And the future is uncertain. But May has, in this moment, bought her derealization and has decided to work on caring, to be honest and open, to take on responsibilities she's been afraid of. The black goat at the center of the game is a fluid metaphor, be it grief, depression, capitalism, or what have you, by recognizing it's there, by not denying it, by finding people who you trust, you're able to live fully, to work on your flaws, to be able to care about who you are, to be the best you that you can be. We begin and we end at night in the woods, but that is not the whole of the story. I began this playthrough with a question to myself. What did night in the woods mean? It was a hard question in part because of how much the game has been a constant in my life and how much of its background was familiar to my own. But the game doesn't really provide answers or closure. And it feels intentional this way. There's an expectation in stories for our protagonist to change or change the world around them in a significant way. But in its conclusion, not much has ultimately changed. Most of the change occurs within May, and you can see that during the final message she writes. But even that progress comes with an understanding that nothing will truly change around her. If anything, the more May learns, the more scared and uncertain she becomes. That uncertainty is the unfortunate truth, that there are forces far greater than we can control at play, that we can't change, that are cruel and unjust. So the question to myself became, how do I talk about this game? What conversations come from it? And I think that there are many paths one can take. One can understand the historical importance of the town and the game it's set in. Small towns like Boston Springs have importance in their history. I never heard of the unionization efforts the game discusses before I played this game. I took multiple US history courses, and not once did I hear about these storied pasts. It took games like this to start questioning the legitimacy of the systems I found myself within. I found more interest in how people live day to day than I ever did the large historical figures that dominated my history classes. It goes beyond the US as well as the history of exploitation and poverty runs deep throughout all histories. To place a game in Possum Springs, such a clear and pointed allegory for an average American town, is to highlight the beauty found inside them, to show their value and importance to those who live there. One can understand the psychological underpinnings about a lack of mental health support found often in the US. With the limited selections and the ever-exploitative insurance system, it's no wonder people like May are left confused and lost on how to deal with their mental health. Feeling depersonalized, that nothing around you is real, is isolating and painful, and it's worsened when it feels like not even going to a professional can help. And it's a sad reality of many, including myself and my youth. I got help, and I got better. I would like to think May did too but a lot of people don't. A lot of people never get out. And one can understand the way the game understands queerness. I didn't really touch on Jackie, but it's really cool how Scott Menson added the explicit mention of her being trans. It meant a lot to me. Beyond that, seeing Greg and Angus was like seeing a younger version of my girlfriend and I. 
the casual inclusion of queerness and the understanding of how hard it can to be queer in a small town feels natural and real. Having these experiences when I was younger let me figure out more about my own queerness as well. One can look at the way the game approaches religion. Its take feels natural and unique. And for me, it opened my eyes as someone disillusioned with religion as to the reasons why faith was important for people, the good that religion could do. It allowed me to be curious and explore my own prejudices. There are pieces of this game I didn't touch on. However, I think I have an answer to the question I titled this video with. I think we should, as with all art, take it upon ourselves to view it with our unique perspectives, to share that with our world. There are ways this game may have connected to you and ways it didn't with me. I think each of those perspectives are valuable and that even though we all played the same game, we didn't have the same experience. Ultimately, I hope my own perspective added value to yours. Thank you for watching.